Release That Witch, Audiobook, Part 11. Chapter 141, A Kiss At night, Roland sat in his office and began designing the new equipment. The appearance of the pill and pour of clear water made him feel a strong sense of crisis. Without thinking about why the church simultaneously supported him and Garcia to vie for the throne, just the fact that Garcia's military strength comprised of thousands of soldiers terrified him greatly. He imagined thousands of steel-clad warriors charging at cavalry speed towards him in an unstoppable manner. His weak line of volley fire would find it hard to stop them. If one of these warriors charged into a group of soldiers, it would cause heavy damage to the first army. Fortunately, this kind of pill could not provide immunity to its user, who thus remained flesh and blood. What Roland needed was higher speed and more precise weapons, so that he could continually fire at the enemies from an even greater distance. He also had to come up with a way to overcome the problem of lacking mercury fulminate to serve as primer. He decided to first manufacture a batch of substitute equipment which would be used to cope during a possible crisis. Anna's new ability gave him immense confidence. At present, as long as he could draw a blueprint, Anna would be able to produce the weapon with high accuracy and astonishing efficiency, unlike in the past when he had to rely on the blacksmiths to hammer out the flintlocks components one at a time, Anna could stack several parts together and cut them into shape together. The universalization of education and the standardization of weights and measures were intended to prepare for industrial mass production, but that did not mean he would not take shortcuts. Anna's new ability was virtually a gold mine of its own possessing an endless well of potential to be tapped. In recent days, Roland would go to North Slope Mountain every afternoon to do research together with her on the usage of black fire. When he did not have time for that, he would let her practice controlling her ability by carving a few small playthings, such as garage kits of the witches. Although, at present, she was still an amateur in sculpturing human figures, Roland believed that there would come a day when the display sections of his bookcase would be crammed with garage kits of witches, perhaps. He took out a steel ruler and pressed it down on the parchment. When he had only drawn two lines, he heard someone knocking on the door. As his guards did not inform him of this arrival, he could guess that it was most likely a witch. And at this time, most witches would be in the parlor on the first floor, learning how to read words and perform the four arithmetic operations from scroll. There was only one witch who did not have to attend elementary class and thus had time to visit him right now. Come in. Indeed, the person who pushed the door and entered the room was Anna. She gently closed the door and walked up to Roland's desk. She was carrying a book that was inlaid with golden edges in her arms that she was able to borrow the Book of Illusions, which Scroll could only reveal once a day, and furthermore to do so before Scroll's lesson, it must be said that although Anna did not talk much, her popularity within the witch's community was evidently yet unexpectedly high. He thought about Nana, who used to follow behind Anna like a tail on her back, maybe Anna was naturally born with a charm that enchanted witches. What's the matter? Did you run into a problem hard to understand? Yes. She nodded in agreement and opened the book in front of Roland. Here. Your Highness, you said that all things in this world are made of small balls and that these balls are all different from each other, but you then mentioned that they can turn into waves? Anna asked. What's a wave? When you throw a stone into water, the vibration created is a wave. The prince coughed twice before continuing. This is a concept. You can observe it but you don't have to research it too deeply. Why is that? Because I don't know more about it myself. Roland did not know whether to laugh or cry. The micro-quantum field was one of the most abstruse theories to him. He suddenly felt that he should not have written this paragraph in the book, but his reply did not match what his brain thought. Therefore, these balls have both wave and material properties. We're also made up of small balls, and thus we're like that too. The only difference is that the quality of our bodies is too high, which makes it difficult to observe fluctuations. As for an even deeper reason, it would take many generations of mankind to discover. He thought for a while before adding. Because there's a considerably large conflict between this kind of phenomenon and our common sense, it may be very difficult to comprehend. 
It's like how those of us living in a three-dimensional world find it hard to visualize four-dimensional space. You don't have to worry about these things. Anna curled her lips as though she was not satisfied with Roland's explanation. She then asked, what's the four-dimensional space? By the time she stopped asking further questions, the prince had spoken until his mouth was completely dry. He had utterly underestimated Anna's curiosity and thirst for knowledge. If this continued, he would soon have nothing left to teach her. Notably, when Roland asked her about her progress in mathematics, she replied with a calm face, that's much easier than this. I'm currently studying equations and matrices, which are rather interesting. Much easier, rather interesting. Roland suddenly felt that the disparity among humans was too large. How long had this been? She had progressed from the basic functions of mathematics to equations and matrices in only a week's time, and after this would be calculus. If placed in a school, Anna would be a terrifyingly quick learner. And, a very pretty quick learner to boot. Roland gazed at the young girl as she lowered her head and flipped through the book. For a short while, he was spellbound. He observed the fine fringes on her forehead and saw as strands of hair fell beside her cheek sporadically. He could not help reaching out his forefinger to gently roll up her hair behind her ears. She turned her head and looked at him with a smile in her eyes. Her turquoise pupils were no longer as calm as water and seemed to ripple. They looked into each other's eyes from this close distance until Anna opened her mouth to say something. She did not make a sound, but Roland could still interpret what her lips said. Nightingale isn't here right now. The meaning of these words could not have been more straightforward. Roland felt that he would be stupid if he pretended not to understand. The room was completely silent, such that he could practically hear her breath and heartbeat. As he moved closer to her, she closed her eyes and her cheeks started to blush. He sniffed the faint scent on her body and gently kissed her lips. A lush and soft feeling spread through his body. Time seemed to freeze at this moment, and it was God knew how long before they briefly separated. Without waiting for him to say anything, Anna tipped her toes, allowing the couple's lips to make contact again. Yee, ha, hey! Mystery Moon sat cross-legged on her bed deep in meditation. She raised her arms high and chanted lines of words. Are you mad? A frowning lily asked while wrapping a towel around her damp hair. I'm trying to think of myself as a composition of particles, she opened her eyes and said, I'm particles. Then she pointed her hand at Lily. You too. Nuts. The latter rolled her eyes and climbed into her soft bed. Aye, it doesn't work. Mystery Moon sighed. I've clearly imagined everything around me to be compositions of particles. Why can't I develop a new ability like Anna did? Because you don't believe it at all. Lily posited. I do. You don't. She shook her head. The only person that we can't deceive is ourselves. Although Anna wasn't clear about Roland's reasons, she trusted unconditionally in him from the very beginning. And of course, she's always been much smarter than you. This is another important reason why she was able to obtain her new ability. In any case, don't imagine too much. Have a good sleep. Lily shrugged her shoulders. Don't you wish to have this kind of ability? Mystery Moon pouted her lips. I want to be able to do more work for Roland. By developing an ability that'll keep food fresh for a longer time? She yawned. I'm not interested. Besides, why would you want to do more work for him? Men are all heartless and capricious. Echo is an example right in front of you. You say you're not interested, but yet you're always so attentive during class, Mystery Moon whispered softly and you're the most serious student after Leaf. Lily grabbed her pillow and clapped it on the former's face. Go to sleep. Chapter 142, The Tram Road It had been half a month since Roland conquered Longsong Stronghold. The five noble families in the stronghold had already delivered the needed people and supplies to border town. After the Ministry of Agriculture was completely organized, spring plowing of a new year finally began, and it was the first step for Roland's agricultural technique revolution. 
the serfs, who saw the dawn of life as freemen, were filled with motivation to work. The scene that a supervisor whipped the serfs and forced them to work was never seen again on the southern bank of Redwater River. Some serfs loafed on the job, only to find that no one came to supervise them again. They heard from the officials who were busy measuring in the fields with strange tools that His Highness did not concern himself about the harvest of one or two fields. From now on, the serfs would work for themselves, and the more they plowed, the more they gained. Not all officials of the Ministry of Agriculture understood the principle of distribution to each according to his work. They were actually required by Roland to unceasingly repeat these ideas to the serfs in order to instill these ideas into their mind. To satisfy His Highness nostalgic feelings, red flags and banners were decorated along the banks of Redwater River. On the banners were written slogans such as labor is the only way to get rich, labor brings honor and glory, labor leads to freedom, and labor changes destiny and so on. Of course these measures met objections from others, for example, Berov was the first one to stand up and express his disapproval. Your Highness, this is totally meaningless. Most serfs aren't able to read, and they don't care about what's written on the banners. These people are just stupid and ignorant. Whips can't even make them better, let alone these banners with strange words. Roland, however, gave a simple answer, those banners aren't meant for them. Then why did you do these things? Hearing this, the assistant minister asked rather confused. To create living models. He never thought the serfs were stupid and unchangeable. It was true that they were not educated, but it did not mean that they had no thoughts. No matter how dull a man might be, he would be driven by desire and interest, which was simply human nature. The repeated words said by the officials of Ministry of Agriculture seemed to produce little effect at first, but would actually inspire them and thus lead them to subconsciously change their old ideas, like little streams would gather to form a sea. When the first group of serfs was promoted to freemen, when they exchanged their harvested crop for money to buy decent clothes and delicious food and even solid and warm brick houses, the often repeated slogans would become a reality and be deeply engraved on their mind. As for the banners along the riverbank, they were for the subjects of border town after they received a universal education. By their own hands, the serfs were able to get rid of poverty, become a formal member of border town and even have a better life than the native inhabitants. All by the power of hard work. By comparing it, people could feel the gap between them. They would then pursue a better life of their own initiative. Only in this way could an individual's efficiency be raised to its highest level. Iron Head stood at the mine entrance waiting for the latest delivery of ores. Since half of his face was burned by the hot steam during the last months of demons, he never dared to stand beside this black machine ever again. Fortunately, there was a kind angel, Miss Nana, in Border Town. Iron Head touched his face which was completely healed, and his heart was filled with gratitude. When he was wounded, he had the nerve to suspect that she was one of the devil's minions. What an offense to her! After the winter, he took two salted fish and a wild boar leg, and then went to the house of Mr. Pine to apologize for his mistake. More surprisingly, though Tigoe Pine was a viscount, unlike those arrogant nobles who held their nose high in the air, he generously accepted his apologies. For the first time, Ironhead felt that not all nobles were cruel and merciless. Old Iron, a miner who was covered with dust ran out of the mine and shouted, the ropes have been fastened. Okay, he turned back to the direction of the steam engine and shouted, everyone, clear the area. Flack, lift up the green rod and then press the red rod. If you make a mistake again, I'll twist your head off. Trust me, old iron. You can count on me, Flack responded loudly. Since Nail was sent to join the first army, Iron had arranged Flack to operate the steam engine. At first, Flack often made mistakes with the order, which caused steam pipes to burst. Iron Head had thrashed him many times for it. Fortunately, His Highness did not blame them for this matter. Instead, he sent people to replace the damaged parts of the machine. And they even did not have to pay money for the damaged parts. Iron Head originally had thought they would be fined a month's salary for it. 
With the opening of the inlet valve, the steam engine spurted out a tremendous amount white smoke and the main wheel began to slowly rotate, leading the capstan to stretch the ropes straight. Cheer up. Watch the ropes. Watch them carefully. Ironhead shouted. Besides the steam engine, the way of pulling the oars out of the mine had changed too. His Highness ordered the carpenters to chop many longwood sticks, which were laid end to end to form rails along the whole mine's tunnels. And then other wood sticks were placed under the parallel wooden rails. At the first glance, it looked like a long wooden ladder. His Highness called it a wood rail transportation system, an awkward name. It did not seem to be very complicated, but it had amazing effects after they used the special trams. How efficient! The oars, which cost them three or four days to carry out of the mine in the past, were packed in several trams and pulled out by the steam engine in a breath. Ironhead had eagerly observed the four-wheel tram running along the wooden rails. It was completely made of iron and so it was extremely expensive. The key to making it move along the narrow rails without falling was its wheels. There was a larger flange on the inside edge of the wheel which fixed it firmly on the rail. Above the wheel was a square iron pot that had hooks at the front and back to connect the trams in a line. He could not help but admire His Highness's wisdom. With such a simple design, he had made the transportation of oars become much easier. Before the invention, the transportation of the heavy oars out of the mine was the most time-consuming and energy-consuming labor. However, this system was not perfect. For example, after they used it for five days, two pieces of wood rails had already been crushed, and other ones were soon broken. The situation was improved after His Highness ordered to wrap the top side of all rails with a thin iron sheet. In addition, the ropes broke once and caused a serious accident. Ironhead still felt his heart was violently beating when he recalled it. According to the regulations, they were only allowed to pull four trams at a time. But on that day, the miners wanted to finish their work more quickly, so they linked six trams together. The tram was halfway there, when a half-arm-thick rope suddenly broke, rebounded, and hit a miner who was standing beside Ironhead. It broke his arm and several ribs. The tram slid down along the rails, knocked down two miners and crushed the legs of another unlucky miner. Luckily Ironhead knew what they should do in such cases. He immediately organized people to carry the wounded miners to the house of Viscount Tigue. As long as they were not dead, Miss Nana would be able to heal them completely. Old Iron, the trams are out, shouted the man who was observing at the entrance. Hearing this, Ironhead ordered loudly. Flack, wait for ten breaths, then turn off the steam engine and mind the order. Yes, gotcha. For trams slowly stopped at the end of the tram road. Ironhead went over to record the ore yield. The first two trams were filled with reddish-brown iron ores, which were found the most in the mine. In the third tram, there were gray ores with a slight yellow tint, which should be copper ores. When he saw the ores in the fourth tram, he was a little shocked, as he had never seen this kind of ores in previous records. They were dark brown and emitted a dim metallic sheen in the sun. Another unknown ore, Ironhead shook his head. North Slope Mine had so many tunnels, so it was normal that they often dug out some strange ores. He drew a cross on his paper and ordered miners to send all ores to the yard. As for these dark brown ores, whether they would be thrown into the furnace or not had nothing to do with him. Chapter 143 The Migrants A sailing ship from Longsong Stronghold slowly berthed at the dock of Border Town. After the gangboard was lowered, the passengers, with all kinds of luggage on their back, began to walk down the trestle. Most of them had never set foot in this strange land before, so they seemed quite confused. The sailors behind were urging them to hurry up, making them feel terribly uneasy. As the crowd began to thrust forward, a middle-aged woman accidentally slipped. She lost her balance and nearly fell from the trestle. Luckily, a younger woman instantly stepped forward and grasped her wrist, saving her from falling. Thank, thank you. The middle-aged woman thanked her profusely with one hand on her chest to calm herself. The younger woman, however, just smiled and waved her hand, indicating that it was no bother. 
Ferlin Eltek was waiting at the dock. He immediately recognized this agile young woman. She was Irene, his beloved wife, the flower of tomorrow of Stronghold Theater. She wore a white dress, and her long hair was coiled up on top of her head, making her beautiful and graceful as before. Though the heart of the first night was beating with excitement, he waited until she had safely landed on the dock. Then he immediately rushed forward to hug her tightly, in spite of the looks and shouts of the people around them. She was startled by the unexpected hug, but once she recognized Ferlin, she responded to his hug gently. I was so terrified to hear that the Duke was defeated. When you were in Longsong Stronghold, I never got the chance to see you, she whispered into his ears, fortunately, you're safe now. I was imprisoned in the dungeon of the Lord's Castle. The guards wouldn't have let you in, Ferlin let go of his wife and said, how have you been these past two weeks? She was silent for a while and then told him, I left the theater. Ferlin immediately understood what was left unsaid. When he was still the first knight of the Western Region, only the Duke would dare to harass her. But when he became a captive of His Highness, those who coveted her beauty no longer hid their desire. They had been waiting for the opportunity to possess her. If she had continued to go to the theater to work, it would have been a suicidal effort. That's all right. I got a job here, and the salary isn't bad. He reassured her. Let's go home first. Home? Irene was surprised. We don't have to live separately. Generally speaking, the prisoners who were neither redeemed nor sentenced to death would work as poor laborers. They had to live in tents or barracks which were crammed with prisoners. They had to sleep on the ground which was covered with wheat straw. The families of the prisoners would be treated similarly. The women had to live in another barrack and also sleep on the ground. When the prisoners were working, the women had to tidy up the men's barracks, prepare meals, and do laundry. Thinking of that, Ferlin felt touched by his wife's choice. If she stayed at the farm of Longsong Stronghold, at least she had her own spacious room with a comfortable and soft bed. Yet she still chose to come to Border Town alone, just for him. Even though she thought she had to live with other women in a small room or a tent and would be forced to work, she did not hesitate. I'm a teacher now. He picked up Irene's luggage and held her hand, heading for the new civilization district. As a teacher, I got my own apartment for free. To be honest, when he first heard the treatment of the teachers from His Highness, he did not expect much. As a prisoner, having his own room would be great. Even if it was a wooden hut with a leaking roof and broken windows, it would be a good shelter after he tried to fix it. He had never expected that the houses for teachers turn out to be so regular. Entering the new district, the streets became wider, and the ground was paved with gray gravel. The roads had been flattened by the stonemasons so that it was comfortable to walk on them. At first, Ferlin could not understand why the stonemasons would bother to waste labor and time. Then he saw how heavy rainwater flowed along the gravel, sinking into the ground and then into the deep drains on both sides of the road. Compared with the narrow alleyways in Longsong Stronghold, which were often muddy and covered with puddles on rainy days, these streets were obviously much better. Irene looked around and asked with confusion, these houses seem to be newly built. Have we gone the wrong way? No, my dear. We're almost there. After they had passed two more corners, Ferlin Eltek stopped in front of a two-story brick house and said to Irene, we're here. Where? She looked around and then turned to the new house in front of her. She covered her mouth with surprise. Is this whole house our new home? Of course not. He smiled. This is the teacher's house, and we live in an apartment in the middle of the second floor. Let's go upstairs. He opened the door with a key from his pocket and led her by her hand into the new home. There were a living room, two bedrooms, and two auxiliary rooms and were well decorated with furniture. It was not large, but surprisingly comfortable. From the living room decoration to the bedroom layout, they were all refreshing. Now with Irene, the hostess of the home, it became even more perfect. Oh my goodness! Are you really taken as a captive here? Irene ran from one room to another eagerly, carefully looking at everything. She was as excited as a child. 
we're really going to live here, right? Yes, of course. Ferlin, with a smile of content on his face, took some bread and cheese from the cupboard and laid them on the table. I'm guessing you didn't eat anything on the ship. Come, let's eat something. I have to go out to work later. Yes, you're a teacher now. Irene ran back to her husband. Which noble family's children are you going to teach? Not the nobles. The subjects of His Highness. Subjects? Irene was dazed for a moment, and then asked, What do you teach them? Ferlin picked up a book from the desk and handed it to her. I teach them how to read and write. His Highness gave me this. Textbook. When he had chosen to be a teacher, he had been afraid that he was not competent enough to do it. After all, teachers were usually knowledgeable, white-haired masters. But His Highness said he only needed to teach according to the textbook. When he read the so-called textbook, he got to know that there were many details and methods in teaching others to read and write. Everything was listed inside, from the methods of teaching to the content. On the first page, there was a list of dozens of frequently asked questions and answers for new teachers. For example, the question for how to become an excellent teacher, how to motivate students to learn or how to test the students, and the answers were plain and easy to understand, but yet gave the reader lots of inspiration. Before he even began his first course, he was already deeply intrigued by this book. So was Irene, clearly. She had lived in the theater since her childhood and had read more books and scripts than Ferlin did. He had once thought, with her beauty and wisdom, if she had been born in a noble family, she would have been a distinguished lady known by the whole western region. After reading through several pages, Irene suddenly raised her head and asked, Did you say? The salary for teachers isn't bad? Twenty silver royals per month, with an increase of five each year. There isn't any theater here, right? No, there isn't. Ferlin hesitated, as he had already guessed what his wife was thinking. Sure enough, she closed the book and smiled. Then I'll also be a teacher, dear. Just like you. Chapter 144 The Real Feelings In the backyard of firing area of North Slope Mine, Nightingale picked up the wine glass on the table and held it above her head. The crystal clear glass body was shining under the light without any trace of model. She was aware that these glasses were called the crystal cup, and its firing process and formula were top secret information in the alchemical workshop. Only the goblet in her hand was valued around one gold royal. The crystal glassware which was matching the exquisite silver tableware had always been the noble and rich businessmen's favorite to show off their wealth. Now, these crystal containers from the royal palace would soon be melted into raw materials. Your Highness, you're not burning the glass, but gold royals. Nightingale exclaimed. I don't have time to study how to turn the sand into the colorless glass, so I can only combine it this way for now. Roland threw a beautifully crafted crystal pot into the furnace made of Anna's black fire. Nightingale could not help but feel pity as she still remembered that Prince Roland used to fill it with ale for the tea parties in the castle garden and for the celebration feast of the months of demons. The pot quickly melted and became a sticky paste under the stable high temperature. Blowing glass, with sand. Anna asked, are they the same substance? Well, the main ingredients are similar, but the sand contains a lot of impurities. The glass that was blown with sand is mostly close to the brown and green in color, which won't meet the requirements. So, glass is actually purified sand? Roland smiled. You could consider so. When I put this knowledge into a book on how the particles formed into a substance, you'll understand once you read it. Nightingale curled her lips and thought, I wouldn't understand. Besides, the color of the glass doesn't affect its function as a container. You wouldn't be using it as a water cup, so why must it made by the glassware? Although they still looked colorless and transparent, their appearance was incomparable to the previous crystal cup. Some looked like a tube with a round bottom, looking thin and long. And some looked like a bottle and the bottom was as large as a kettle and the bottleneck was only as thick as a thumb. The strangest one was a tube that was bent into a horseshoe shape with both sides unsealed, and it was not even a container. 
What do you intend to do with the crystal glassware? Nightingale could not help asking. It isn't for me but for the use of the border town alchemist, said Roland while stirring the paste in black fire with a glass stick. They can use these glasswares to extract some acid and alkaline in order to produce some chemicals for the new weapons I created. Acid? Alkaline? Chemicals? Nightingale blinked, realizing that she did not understand what His Highness said. It made her feel a little bit depressed. Of course, she could always ask about them one by one, but she felt that it seemed too ignorant and she did not want to expose that side of her in front of Anna, so she could only pay attention to the nouns that she could understand. Since when did Border Town have an alchemist? There's no alchemical workshop even in Longsong Stronghold. You can only find alchemists in Redwater City. I heard that their salary is higher than the Lord, and it's rather hard to recruit them with only gold royals. You know quite a lot, Roland answered with a smile, that's right. I've sent people who are already on their way to Redwater City. We'll likely receive a message in about two weeks. However, I'm not recruiting them with gold royals, but some alchemical secrets. As for our chances, I'm not very sure myself. But it's worth a try. The compliment from His Highness during the first half of the conversation had suddenly blown away Nightingale's depression, and she contentedly walked back to the center of the yard and stuffed a pastry from a round table into her mouth. Since Roland changed the main experimental site from the castle backyard to the firing area of North Slope Mount, the afternoon tea was also shifted. On the round table were all the royal snacks that were specially made by the chef for His Highness. For example, this snack was called steamed bun. The skin was made from the wheat flour which was specially handled, making it extremely soft and chewy. There was also a meat stuffing wrapped inside. The meat was finely chopped and it was extremely juicy. Unlike the salted meat which was hard and difficult to swallow, the minced meat and juice would be integrated into one in a bite. Nightingale put her fingers into her mouth and sucked them one by one while sitting on the couch. She felt a slight sleepiness. Am I getting lazier recently, she thought. The afternoon sun shone on her which felt like the warm water slowly wrapping around her. The spring breeze was blowing on the leaves making a shuffling noise. She felt extremely calm and quiet. She took off her shoes and curled her legs up, lying down on one side. This perspective led to the view of the backyard to the side door of gunpowder making room. A curtain was hanging down from the door, which was used by His Highness to prevent her from sneaking in. Thinking about it, Nightingale found it slightly funny. Both the courtyard wall and the gunpowder making room wall were just a flat ground which she could freely walk into. She had even entered the mysterious house and listened to His Highness who was talking about the production method quietly at one side, but just that, she did not take away the finished gunpowder. While Roland thought that no one knew about it, he himself was the one who did not know the truth. Nightingale shifted her head to look at Anna. She was holding a flat cup, which was just blown and she was talking to His Highness. She looked serious and focused. Nightingale really admired Anna. She was a girl who came from a civilian family and yet she was so extremely talented. It was Anna who brought the Sisters of Witch Cooperation Association to escape the fate of the displacement and freed them from the magic power bite. If it were not her who changed Prince Roland's view of the witches, all the subsequent changes would not happen. If His Royal Highness would marry a witch, Anna would be the only person she could think of. Although she still had a slight expectation, Nightingale chose to deeply bury it in the bottom of her heart. As long as she could just stay around His Highness most of the time, she would be contented. She closed her eyes and imagined a scene uncontrollably. Roland was royally ascended in the palace. He wore a golden crown and held a gemstone scepter while walking towards the castle terrace to accept the public respect and cheers. The girl in a white satin gown walking arm in arm with him was Anna, who also wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was covered by a veil. She smiled and waved to the people. Lightning was hovering in the air, sprinkling the bright red rose petals. The melodious bell rang from the king's city belfry afar. She herself was standing with the other sisters, applauding and sending their blessings. She was increasingly drowsy and her consciousness gradually became hazy. 
Roland turned around, opened the veil of the girl, and lowered his head to kiss her on her lips. The last scene became very vague, with the veil falling on the floor, Nightingale faintly saw that the girl with her eyes closed, appeared to be herself. She smiled and fell asleep. Chapter 145 The Quest of Pursuit, Part 1 Theo walked into a pub, where he could smell the strong smell of the hot and humid air that was mixed with beer smell. Under the dim light, the men were bare-chested, their sweaty backs revealed. They sat at the bar table in the center, gulping down pints of cheap beer while chatting noisily with their companions. The scantily clad maids were interspersed among the beer tables filling up the guests' glasses. He looked around and found himself a target, a petite man who was sitting in the corner, and there was a withered wild rose on this table. Theo walked towards the bar and ordered a pint of beer. He slowly savored the bitterness while looking around to see if there was anyone else secretly watching the petite man. He was very satisfied with what he saw. Although patrons would occasionally glance towards the corner, most were inadvertent. Only one person at the center table made the effort to cover his observation with his beer glass. One person to connect, another person to coordinate was the practice of rats in the Black Street, which was coincided with Theo's understanding. One more, he shouted at the bartender, iced. Sir, the price of cold beer is double, the bartender reminded. Theo threw a silver royals out and said, the icier the better. Theo walked towards the petite man with the foaming beer in hand and poured it onto the wild rose. The cold beer flowed down the curled petals. The man raised his head and said impatiently, pouring such a good beer on the table instead of drinking it, are you crazy? Paying respect to the rose, Theo smiled and sat opposite the other party. We've been looking for you. It only proved that you weren't looking at the right direction, he rudely said, but since you're a customer, go ahead. How can I help you? Ask for a clue, to steal, to redeem the lost property, or stolen goods. Neither, I hope you can help me to spread a rumor. That's not within the business scope of the Wild Rose. He shook his head. No, no, no. You would be interested in anything as long as it could be paid with gold royals. Theo shook his finger at him. Young man, I'm not a layman. In order to get the prey hooked, we sometimes need to create a bait and rumor is the best bait, which has no evidence and arresting point. It's safer than stealing. This sounds very reasonable, the other party straightened, showing a trace of a smile. You've commissioned Wild Rose before? I once entrusted your competitor from a small place. The name isn't as elegant as yours, and they can't do much. The business scope is too small and it's hard to find the right business whereas in Silver City, competition is fierce. He picked up the wild rose and shook it off a little before putting it into his pocket. So, what kind of rumors do you need to spread? News about the witches. Theo smiled. An organization called the Witch Cooperation Association has found Holy Mountain in the western region, and they've overcome the demonic torture and gained eternal peace. Brother, this news is really. The petite man clocked. Really old school. Although I rarely abet the customers on deceiving, you have to at least come out with one that makes more sense. Let me guess, either you're trying to abduct a witch or to act against the church. For the latter, you would only be waiting for the judgment army to hang you to death, so I would think it's the former. He showed a nasty smile. Unfortunately, as far as I know, almost all of those who wanted to catch the witches and sell them for money are dead. Even though they all have God's stone of retaliation with them, those women aren't idiots. Why doesn't it make sense? Theo asked curiously. A union organized by the witches is just like the moon in the dark night sky. If it was true, the church would certainly flock there, and if I were a witch, I wouldn't go to that kind of place. If it was false, then I would have no reason to go there. As for the demonic torture, brother, are you serious? Witches are the embodiment of the devil, and this is such a big lie that even the witches will scoff. Then just spread it like this, Theo said without taking it seriously. The customer has the final say. The petite man shrugged. Anyway, I have to remind you that it costs 20 gold royals. Do I pay in one shot? 
Yes, Wild Rose doesn't accept any deposit or final payment, he said, and the trade is entirely voluntary. Theo sighed. He took out a sack from his pocket and poured 19 gold royals on the table, and then he seized a handful of silver royals which were only the size of a fingernail and counted out 100 pieces before pushing the money toward the man in front of him. The latter only checked the authenticity of the gold royals and swept all the money into his bag. After receiving the money, the petite man was much more relaxed. It's rare that Wild Rose can't deliver what was promised. As I told you before, the competition in Silver City is very fierce, and our reputation would be ruined if we deceived the customers. If you're not in a hurry to return to the Western region, you could stay here for a few more days. You'll hear the news everywhere not before long. Will it spread to the witch's ears? Of course, but it depends if they're willing to go. In short, I wish you success. You'll be able to cover the cost if you sell one to the church or you can earn more by selling them to the noble. Of course, if you can't find a way out and afraid to be found by the church, you can always come to us, we only charge a 10% of the introduction fee. The petite man snapped and walked away with the bag. The man who was responsible for the coordination also got up and left soon after him. Theo finished the rest of his beer with a gulp after waiting fifteen minutes and hiccuped before walking out of the pub. His highness' task was now complete. Theo had gone all around, first from Fallen Dragon Ridge, then to Redwater City, finally to Silver City, to find the rats from Black Street and spread the news. Every city had a group of them in a dark corner. They formed an orderly and hidden organization even under the acquiescence of the Lord, including the King's City of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. What they could do was far more than those who spoke. As to what extent was mainly dependent on the number of gold royals the customers had. The only difficulty was in finding a connection with the rats. Not to mention it was rather difficult for him as an outsider to gain their trust. It cost him at least five gold royals just to speak to them. If it were not for his similar experience in the King's City, he would probably still be in the Fallen Dragon Ridge right now. Walking on the way back to the hotel, he was aware of the strange atmosphere. He was followed. Although the other party was acting very subtly, however, Theo as a professional guard was aware of the presence of her. He quietly drew the dagger at his waist and turned into an alley on the edge. Was it Wild Rose? He had purposely emptied the sack to find the nineteen gold royals when he paid to avoid others from coveting. In general, they would not loot for a few hundreds of silver royals. He leaned against the wall, counting the footsteps that were getting closer and closer. He rushed out suddenly as the other party was about to pass through the alley. His dagger suddenly appeared on the other party's neck. Don't move! Theo shouted. The other party suddenly turned into a mass of fog and disappeared. A witch! He realized and before he could make a noise, his neck was hit heavily from behind. He suddenly felt a sense of dizziness and lost all his strength, falling to the ground. Chapter 146 The Quest of Pursuit, Part 2 Theo awoke, the back of his neck tingling with pain. Damn it, these women are ruthless. He opened his eyes and tried to move but found his hands were tightly tied behind him and that his feet were tied to the chair. He's awake. He heard the voice of a woman. Your name? One of them came to him and lifted his chin. I suggest you not lie, or your corpse shall be found in the city moat tomorrow. Theo blinked. The woman was wearing a veil over her head and her body was covered in a robe. She obviously did not want to reveal her appearance. Theo, he replied truthfully while looking around. It was a narrow room surrounded by dusty plaster statues. Some of the statues had been completed while some appeared to be only carved halfway. The accumulation of dust dyed the plaster gray and it looked like the place had been abandoned for a long time. There was no window in the room and so it was impossible to speculate the time, and the only light source was from an oil lamp on the wall. You've been relentlessly looking for us from Fallen Dragon Ridge to Silver City, the woman coldly said. Why are you looking for us? I'm not the one who's looking for you, and it's the Witch Cooperation Association. What's the Witch Cooperation Association? 
a witch organization just like yours. I was sent by them to spread the news. Nonsense. She snapped. I don't know where you heard the name, but the Witch Cooperation Association was far away at Sea Windshire in the eastern region. You think we would believe you simply because you recited a name? The woman drew a dagger out from her waist. Theo noticed that it was exactly the dagger he used earlier on. I'll give you one last chance. Don't test my patience. I'm telling the truth, he said in a suppressed voice as he wanted to shout but did not dare. They intended to go to the impassable mountain range to look for Holy Mountain. They had not only found Holy Mountain but also settled down in Border Town. The demonic torture has also disappeared and therefore, they want to save more witches. I swear I'm not lying. Why did they look for you? It's because I helped them before. A member of the Union was besieged by the Judgment Army of the Church, and I helped her to distract the soldiers. Their mentor was Kara. It was Wendy and Scroll who asked me to come here. The masked woman kept quiet for a moment after listening, and then she put the dagger back into her waist and walked behind him. Soon, Theo heard the whispering sound of two people behind him. Newbie, he thought, these two women are pretty accurate on the sneak attack, but the trial is completely and utterly the work of a novice. The taboo of a trial was to get only one chance to choose. If there was no answer given, it could easily give the interrogator nowhere to go. To kill or not to kill? If it was to kill, the possibility of getting the information was lost. If it was not to kill, it was equivalent to failing to achieve the threatening effect the interrogator mentioned. It would seriously damage the majesty of the interrogator, and the effectiveness of the next threat would also be significantly reduced. If it were for him to interrogate, he would certainly start with finger torture. A finger would be cut off for every lie, so even if there was a mistake, it would not be a big problem. The threat that was acted upon accordingly would quickly collapse the will of the enemy. It would be hard to carry out such a trial for those that had not been professionally trained. The other party was in doubt as soon as he acted frightened. That exposed the fact that they simply could not identify whether or not he was lying. The information of Kara, Holy Mountain and the Witch Cooperation Association were all true and reliable, which would further strengthen his position. After a while, the masked woman appeared before him. When did they go to the western region? Two or three months before the Months of Demons. After the winter, they returned to the town and announced that they had found Holy Mountain. How many, of them? About forty of them? I'm not sure, except Kara, the other witches did not appear very often. Theo decided to add a little more bargaining chips. The snake witch Kara, did you hear about her? Her ability is to summon the snake of magic, and one kind of it called nothingness. It can quickly remove any toxins. I have seen it myself and it was so magical. You're not afraid of the witches? The woman sounded a bit puzzled. Why should I be afraid? The witches in the Witch Cooperation Association are all beautiful. They aren't the demonic beasts with bare fangs and brandish claws that people have said they are and they don't hurt ordinary people. If I'm afraid, I wouldn't come this far to help them spread the news. If someone went to Border Town, how should they contact them? One of them can sense magic power, and then they'll find any witch once that goes there. Shadow, what do you think? The masked woman looked behind him. I don't know, said the witch called Shadow, let's wait for Sister to come back and make the decision. She would definitely know what to do. Yeah. She nodded. She found a chair which could be considered clean and sat in front of Theo. Who's your sister? The guide. The masked woman's attitude had softened a lot compared to before, and it was probably due to him saying that he was not afraid of witches. She'll take us out of here. Leaving? Where are you going? The other party shook her head and did not answer. You're not the witch from Silver City, right? Theo continued, your accent doesn't sound like the people from the King's City. Silver City is close by, so the people here are proud of imitating the accents of the King's City. She hesitated for a moment, I am from the Southern Territory. The witches from all over the kingdom have gathered here and are soon to be led by the guide to go somewhere else. Theo thought to himself, 
I have no doubt that this is a witch organization, and they're recruiting companions, just like the Witch Cooperation Association. But, where are they going? This was when footsteps came from outside of the shed again. Sister is back. Shadow cheered as the wooden door squeaked opened. Theo held his breath in his heart. Is he the one that had been using the underground channel to spread the message? The voice of the newcomer was mature and steady. What information did you get from the interrogation? He seems to be telling the truth. The masked woman repeated the investigated content and stated her thoughts. It's not possible for him to know so clearly if he did not have a lot of contact with the Witch Cooperation Association. Well, that's true. She walked past Theo and stood in front of him. Different from the masked girl, and she did not cover her face. Her long black hair almost reached her waist and she looked around 25 or 26 years old. The most interesting part of her was her eyes. Theo found her pupils appeared to be golden color, and her star-like eyes could be seen so clearly that even when she was standing in the dark they were visible. Theo thought that he had seen many witches around his highness, but the appearance of this woman was still considered as one of the best. There was a deep scar that went across her eyebrow and extended down to her cheek. The scar did not destroy her beauty but added a sense of seriousness to her look. Since seeing her face, Theo felt that this woman was a warrior. If the Witch Cooperation Association really found Holy Mountain, they should not send people to spread such a message. She shook her head. This will only bring the church. If they don't leave Border Town as quickly as possible, I'm afraid disaster is around the corner. Then, what should we do? Shadow asked. The ship will arrive at midnight. There'll be other witches on board and so you have to leave, she said without hesitation. I'll escort you on board. As for the Witch Cooperation Association. The black-haired woman looked at Theo who was tied to the chair and said, Please help me to get a message to Tilly. Tell her that I'll be there a few days later. Perhaps I can bring more companions. Are you going to border town with him? Shadow said in shock, What if this is a scam? So, he'll only kill himself. She smiled, her words full of confidence. Chapter 147 The Emissary Delegation Alicia had never thought she would one day be a part of the emissary delegation. After all, whenever the church sent an emissary delegation, the members were always elite warriors. They were not only blessed with civil and martial virtues, but also looked good enough to represent the church. She was very confident about her fighting skills and the rights of the church. But when it came to her appearance, how good-looking could a woman who was swinging her huge sword in battlefields all day long be? Thinking about this made her uncomfortable. According to Priest Mira, their delegation would head to a small town in the western region of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. Their purpose was to deal with the blasphemous event of a prince harboring witches. Aside from the priest leading the delegation, there were another ten members of the Judgment Army. One of them was even the stony-faced cool captain she had once met in Hermes' defense. But from the looks of it, the man was still stony-faced even in the absence of combat. Alicia felt the temperature dropped a fair bit just by standing next to him. Priestess Mira was completely different. She was over forty years old and had a pair of wise-looking eyes. She wore a constant smile on her face when she discussed anecdotes about the church. She was sophisticated and warm without losing an ounce of grace. Even in front of the archbishop, her poise was unabated. Alicia had heard many times that she would likely be the next bishop. What surprised Alicia, however, was that Mira as a civil official rode her horse as well as those in the judgment army. In these two days, she led the procession, from the forest and the mountains to the town tracks. She kept her horse moving at a stable pace while minimizing any physical exertion. This was a skill that would take a person of the Judgment Army a long time to master. We're heading south, aren't we? Someone in the procession asked after leaving the Hermes area and entering the Kingdom of Grey Castle. No. Border Town is too far away from us. I don't want to hurt my butt if we travel by land, Mira waved and said, and we'll go east to Deep Valley Town. There's a river that can take us directly to Redwater City. 
From there, it'll be an easy path to Longsong Stronghold. When did you join the church? Alicia asked curiously, you're not only familiar with anecdotes of Holy City, but also well-versed with the secular world. Twelve years ago. I was exactly thirty years old then, Mira replied. That's so late. Alicia exclaimed. As far as I know, the older a person is, the more difficult it's for her to comprehend the teachings of the deities. But you took only ten years to promote yourself from a believer to a priest. That's incredible. Yes, Mira smiled. That's the charm of the church. I was the daughter of a merchant. I followed my father and learned to do business in the four kingdoms. We bought ordinary local commodities and resold them for higher prices in other places. The price could go several times higher. Take the emerald coral of Sea Windshire, for example. We bought it from a local fisherman for twenty or thirty silver royals. We then put it into a water tank, carried it to the kingdom of Everwinter, and sold it for a gold royal. If the coral had a good color and well-distributed branches, we could sell it for over five gold royals. I used to wonder why the same item would have two different values. Because, it was rare? Alicia replied. That was what I thought at first. The priestess nodded. But something happened and my opinion changed. There was a noble in the king's city who harbored a witch capable of changing the temperature. He came up with different ways before he finally succeeded in growing sea wind shire corals in the kingdom of Everwinter. He modified the basement under his yard into a huge pool with an overhead skylight. His harvest was about once a year. The corals he grew were more than our yield for ten back and forth trips. But the trade road was so long that my father only took it once a year. As a result, the emerald corals flooded the market. The noble even sold them both to the palace and aristocrats. If a rare object became more common, it was only fair that the price would drop. But just two years later, the palace refused to accept low-priced emerald corals, thinking they were counterfeits. Not only did my father not slash the prices by half, he even doubled it. As for the noble, he was discovered by the church and charged with the crime of harboring witches. He, together with the witch, was tied to a stake and burned to death. But I knew his corals were not counterfeits. They were exactly the same as the ones my father sold. The idea that a rare object is priceless isn't wrong. But there are other factors affecting the price of an item. This is the simplest example. Since the Palace of Kingdom of Everwinter treated the emerald corals as a symbol of luxury, they set its value. When more emerald corals appeared, the rules of royalty were impacted. Thus on the day of the noble's execution, the queen even threw a big celebration. Do you think these items are like those of us who are secular? Like, what? Alicia was lost. Like the people, the children under the throne, said Mira word by word, we are born with a price, and this price doesn't reflect our real value. Just like this emerald coral, we are obviously same but some are at a low price, and some are too high to be reached. Too high for us to attain. You mean the nobles? The nobles are like the corals of the Palace of Kingdom of Everwinter. The priestess smiled. We're all born having the same hands, feet, a pair of eyes, and a mouth. However, their prices are set at the highest value. That's not determined by their own abilities, but by the rule of the royalty. So I joined the church. At least, in the new holy city of Hermes, your birth doesn't limit your value. If we could turn the entire continent into the final holy city of the church, then that would be our so-called divine state. You've made a very good point. Alicia nodded repeatedly with excitement coursing through her. If they really managed to build kingdom of God as per Myra's descriptions, where people were born without classes and there were no lowlifes and serfs, it would make a beautiful landscape. Kingdom of God? The stony-faced captain of the Judgment Army scoffed and stepped forward. How many more people do they want to turn into cold-blooded monsters? Honorable Priestess, and how much do you know about God's Punishment Army? Hey, you! Just as Alicia was about to reprimand him for his lack of courtesy, Mira stopped her. The God's Punishment Army is made up of the most powerful fighters in the church. 
they're faithful, willing to devote themselves, and brave enough to join the God's Punishment Army. Not bad. You're right about them being the most powerful fighters and converting into the army. But what they convert into aren't warriors, but a group of emotionless monsters instead. Having coldly spat out this sentence, he rode away and ahead of the team. How rude! Alicia said angrily. When she met him in Hermes, she considered him a calm person with the steadiness of a general and the bravery of a soldier. How did he become this kind of person? It's all right. He's just distracted. Mira shook her head. Setbacks and sacrifices are inevitable in the building of kingdom of God on earth. But at least we're willing to do so. When the team arrived at the next town, it was already dark. The priestess led the delegation to the church to take a rest. After dinner, they went back to their rooms. Alicia followed the captain and stopped him in the hallway. Priestess Mira is our leader. What did you mean by saying those things earlier? Have you forgotten all the rules of the church? You're Alicia, aren't you? He only spoke after a moment of silence. Yes, I'm a caption like you. I asked for your name as early as in the months of demons, but you said nothing. May I know your name now? Abrams, he answered without expression, as for why I said that. Do you have any siblings? No. Alicia suddenly remembered that Abrams once said his elder brother was a member of the God's Punishment Army. I have one. We grew up together in the church. We knew each other so well like we were one person. Later, he took the initiative to accept the conversion and I never saw him again. The Chief Justice told me that his conversion was so successful that he was now doing special missions for the church. I was very happy for him. He paused. That was until I saw him again in a cathedral one day. I called his name and want to go forward to hug him. Guess what I saw? His expression showed a hint of pain. A stranger. It was as if he didn't see me. He walked straight past me. There was no light in his eyes at all, which only stared straight ahead. His movements were completely inhuman. A shiver ran down Alicia's back. She badly wanted to shout that he was lying, but when she opened her mouth, no sound came. The God's Punishment Army deprives their fighters of human emotions. They're nothing more than a group of walking corpses. He pushed stunned Alicia away and returned to his room without looking back. Chapter 148 A Merchant from the King's City, Part 1 Border Town finally had a rainy day. The sky was overspread by thick clouds. The rain poured in torrents and pattered on panes and windows. Spring was usually a wet and warm season. This was not the case. After the months of demons, there was hardly any rain in border town. Fortunately, farmlands were just by the river, making it easier for farmers to water their crops. The heavy rain had dispelled the sultriness in the air. Nightingale opened the window to let the scent of soil fill the room. Across Redwater River, young buds were shooting forth from the field at a distance. The endless green wheat wound underneath the canopy of the sky until it disappeared from sight. Quite contrary to the somber river, the crops appeared fresher and more vivacious than ever after the rain. Roland stretched himself and threw the quill in his hand into a pen holder. Done? Nightingale asked. Yes. A brand new weapon which can increase the shooting speed of flintlocks by several times. Roland stacked up a dozen sheets of blueprints and then said, I call it a revolving rifle. Do you want to take a look? No. Nightingale twitched her mouth. I don't understand it anyway. This is just a prototype. If I shorten the barrel, it'll turn into a portable revolver. But I need to solve another key technical issue before I can put it into use. If everybody has one such kind of weapon, we won't need to be afraid of the Judgment Army from the church anymore. Are you saying it'll make an ordinary woman as powerful as a fully armed strong man? Not just one, but several. Roland smiled triumphantly. If we're lucky, we can make this number into five. Nightingale appeared perfectly incredulous. She was about to say something when suddenly there was a knock on the office door. Your Highness. 
Barrow's apprentice just returned from the king's city. He also brought a merchant who sells saltpeter. They're waiting for you outside the castle at the moment. The apprentice of the assistant minister? Roland thought for a while and recalled the matter. As the gunpowder had been running out when he had attacked Longsong stronghold, he had sent his guards to Fallen Dragon Ridge and Redwater City for new saltpeter suppliers. Barrow's apprentice, whose destination was the King's City, was the last one to commence his journey. After all, King's City had everything. As summer was around the corner, the production of saltpeter must be increasing rapidly. Roland had not expected the last to take his departure was actually the first to bring good news. Take them to the living room. I'll be right there. Roland looked up at the sky and added, ask the kitchen staff to prepare some desserts as well. By the time he turned around, Nightingale had been out of sight. But he knew she was right beside him. When Roland entered the living room, the merchant who sold saltpeter was just walking into the hall under the guidance of the guard. She took off her drenched cloak and straw hat before bowing to the prince. I'm Margaret Farman from the King City. Please accept my warmest regards, Your Highness. Roland was taken by surprise when he noticed the merchant was a lady. It was far less safe to do business in this era than in the modern world, as tradesmen frequently encountered bandits and refugees when they traveled, not to mention the harassment of local bullies and underground gangsters. Because of this, not many women engaged in business. Like Lightning, Margaret also had fair blonde hair, but hers was denser and longer. She looked in her thirties. Probably because she was not a noble but simply an ordinary woman, she already got wrinkles around the corners of her eyes and on her forehead. Her skin was a bit dark and even a little coarse at the first glance. From her appearance, however, Roland felt she did not look like a Majin but instead a fjord's native. Please take a seat. The prince motioned her to sit down and seated himself in the host's seat. You aren't from the kingdom of Grey Castle, are you? Why did you say that? Margaret smiled. You've got a hair color that's pretty rare in inland countries. As far as my knowledge goes, most people who live across the channel have beautiful blonde hair. I know an explorer from fjords as well. You're indeed a learned man. My native town is at fjords, but I've been here for over ten years. I'm currently living in the Kingdom of Grey Castle, and I consider myself as a half-native of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. She paused for a moment and then said, you just left the King's City not a while ago. Perhaps we've met somewhere else before. I feel honored to live in a city that your highness once stayed at. Apparently, every successful merchant had exceptional communication and diplomatic skills. Roland knew Margaret was trying to flatter him, but he still felt quite pleased with the comment. Just when he was absorbed in the compliment, Nightingale pinched his right shoulder with great strength. Well, Nightingale, you're being over-responsible. In this case, there's no need to check the credibility of her words. Roland said within himself. But speaking of explorer, it's a highly respected title in the fjords. Margaret went on. You probably don't know. There are few lands in the fjords that re suitable for a dwelling. As the tides rise and recede continuously, some islands will be swallowed by the rising seawater. Some, on the other hand, constantly erupt into flames and smoke. Rocks will melt into a dark red river at such a high temperature. Only those who have discovered a new sailing route or a new island suitable for life are qualified for such a title. Ordinary people won't call themselves explorers. Ha! She not only calls herself an explorer but also calls her father the greatest explorer ever. Roland shook his head with a smile. She's just a kid. Kids always like to imagine themselves as some sort of great men. Even kids won't be so reckless as to regard themselves as explorers in the fjords. Margaret frowned. Did she say who his father is? Roland realized he had just made a mistake by the look on Margaret's face. It seemed to fjords natives, the word explorer contained some sacred, spiritual meanings, which could not be used unscrupulously. Her father's name is Thunder. To Roland's surprise, Margaret's eyes widened as soon as she heard the name. You're acquainted with Mr. Thunder? No, but I know his daughter. 
have you heard of him? Everybody in the fjords is familiar with that name. Mr. Thunder discovered Double Peak Island and Sea Dragon Bay, expanding our living area almost by half. He also drew a detailed map of the East Coast and Endless Cape. Eighty percent of the current routes on this continent were discovered by him. Every kid knows Mr. Thunder's stories by heart. He's one of the most extraordinary explorers in the fjords. But I've heard Thunder died in a storm. No, your highness. A true explorer won't be easily defeated by a storm. He encountered numerous dangers but always managed to escape. Mr. Thunder at present must be recruiting new crews somewhere, just like what he did before. Margaret leaned forward a little bit. Your Highness, do you know where his daughter is? Roland was also surprised by the fact that Lightning's father was such a well-known figure. Did that indicate all those adventures, as bizarre as the Arabian Nights, were indeed true? She's living right in the castle at the moment. She headed west after the storm until her arrival at Border Town, where I took her in. In your castle? Margaret could barely hide her anticipation. Can I? Have your permission to meet his daughter? Well, I'm afraid not now. Roland was pretty sure that Lightning was currently flying around the misty forest trying to locate the relic marked on the treasure map. She's now practicing her jungle exploration skills. If you intend to stay over, you should be able to see her. Then please excuse my intrusion. Margaret nodded instantly. So, can we now jump into the business? Of course, your highness. She smiled. Please feel free to start. Chapter 149, A Merchant from the King's City, Part 2 Do you primarily sell saltpeter in the King's City? Roland came straight to the point. No, your highness. The smile on Margaret's face was no longer a fake one of formality but became more sincere and cordial. I sell many products, from gemstones to fabrics, and I also run inns and taverns. In fact, I just started selling saltpeter a month ago. The previous business owner lost everything in my casino and had to put a lien on his plant. She not only sells various goods but also involves in the service industry. What kind of businesswoman is she? Roland knew it required more than capitals to operate a casino in the King's City. He knocked on the desk, but Nightingale simply pinched his neck, which meant Margaret was wearing a god stone of retaliation that blocked her scrutiny. Hang on. If Nightingale can't detect lies, why did she pinch his right shoulder earlier? Roland coughed and suppressed the desire to turn around and question her. He had heard some merchants from fjords, after settling down in the Four Kingdoms, expanded their business and accumulated incredible fortunes. After all, fjords' natives were all born businessmen who were not only fearless and adventurous but also good at sniffing out a business opportunity. Although many of them were ripped off by the government, some managed to establish themselves. By lobbying with local authorities, they formed a relatively stable alliance with some distinguished figures. Could Margaret also be one of the successful ones? If this was the case, Roland felt it would be better to save the small talks and directly state his needs. I want a large quantity of saltpeter. The more, the better. But the western region of the kingdom isn't hot, especially for the towns close to the impassable mountain range. Do you really need that much saltpeter? Your Highness? Margaret asked curiously, I own three plants in the suburb of the King's City, which will suffice the needs of nobles in a medium-sized city. Three plants? Roland was internally exhilarated by the news but still remained expressionless. I plan to build a freezer in the basement of the castle to preserve some food that goes bad easily. If you offer me a reasonable price, I'd like to purchase all your saltpeter. Margaret nodded. Well, since you're being so straightforward, I'm willing to ship all my saltpeter to Border Town and give you a 10% off on the current market price. But? But what? I don't really want gold royals. My warehouse is full of them. I've heard you have some unique products, which I'm really interested in using as a substitution for gold royals if you don't mind. I'll be happy to make the deal with you if you agree to this term. Some unique products? Roland was surprised. 
Margaret was the first person that he had ever known who did not want gold royals. Yes. For example, an automatic machine made of black iron. The merchant leaned forward a little bit and said, Your servant told me it only requires some boiling water to produce immense power. In fact, this is what made me decide to come to Border Town in person. Otherwise, I actually prefer to sell my saltpeter to nobles in the King's City. Border Town, after all, was very far, and the shipping costs a lot. This is indeed unexpected, Roland thought. Although he did not know how Barov's apprentice found her and how they turned their subject to steam engines, it was evident that this merchant from the King's City was very interested in it. Roland knew very well how enormous the profits industrial goods could bring, especially for those machines that only he knew how to manufacture. He had been worried that the money in the Duke's mansion would exhaust eventually after Border Town stopped selling ores. Now, a great business opportunity had just been presented to him. I know what you're talking about. The prince smiled. It's called a steam engine. Its operation mechanism is pretty simple, which is to convert the steam of boiling water into power. But only Border Town manufactures this kind of machine. So it does exist? Of course. Roland spread out his hands. But its manufacture process is very complicated and the price is steep. If you're interested, I can show it to you. I would love to see it. She rose in excitement. When Margaret saw the roaring steel monster slowly pull the mine car out of the mine at the North Slope mine, her eyes almost bulged out under her lids. Your Highness, it, it's so inconceivable. There was a tinge of tremor in her voice. I thought your messenger was just exaggerating, but the truth is actually more fascinating than his description. I'm afraid one, steam engine can replace, more than dozens of people's labor. Margaret wanted to take a closer look but was stopped by Roland. It's too dangerous to approach an operating steam engine. Don't get too close to it. See that white steam puffing out? A little can burn you. Do you use it only to ship oars? As the machine was too loud, Margaret had to crane her neck and raised her voice. There are two in total at the mine. The first one is responsible for pulling mine cars and the second one for drawing water from the mine, Roland replied, in fact, the machine can also replace windmills and watermills to grind wheat. It won't be affected by water currents or wind and can save a lot of manpower and animal labor. It can even set paddles in motion and thus be used as a power source for a sailing ship. With a steam engine, you can operate a sailing ship even without wind. Roland knew what a boat that did not need to rely on wind power and wind directions meant to Fjord's people. As he had expected, Margaret's eyes were glowing with excitement. Make an offer. I want to buy it. I can't sell this one to you, as the mine needs it for production. You can pre-order some new steam engines. Once your saltpeter arrives, I'll send you my invoice. What about the price? Roland led her to a quieter spot slightly away from the mine, 500 gold royals, Roland answered. It was definitely overpriced, for the number was almost equal to the annual income of a knight in the territory. The overhead cost for a steam engine was around 20 gold royals. It would be no more than 50 gold royals in total after adding smelting costs, labor costs and installation costs, but it created big room for bargaining. Then that's the deal. I want to purchase ten steam engines. Roland was speechless for a second. Ten steam engines meant five thousand gold royals, which was pretty much a five to six years savings of Duke Ryan's. As Margaret did not even bargain, Roland wondered if this was normally the way an ultra-rich merchant did her business. He cleared his throat and asked, Are you sure? This is a big sum of money. Plus, it isn't going to be a one-time investment. You have to spend a lot as well on future maintenance. I know. It's just like maintaining a boat. You need to clean it annually to get rid of algae and tiny marine creatures nested in the hull and replace new sails, ropes, etc., Margaret said carelessly, let me know what needs to be changed or added, and I'll purchase them. If that doesn't work, you can just sell me the laborers who maintain and operate the machine altogether at another price. Roland shut his mouth. There was only one idea in his mind, 
It felt so good to have incessant money. Chapter 150 A Stone Tower Lightning was flying above Misty Forest. The world seemed to shrink in her eyes. All the details had become obscure in her sight, with only various color blocks left. The brown one was earth, gray the mountains, green the forests and blue the rivers. Green, however, occupied most of the landscape she saw. Unlike the bright, vibrant green color of the fields in border town, the green color here was dark and intense, mingled with some gray and black shades. The endless dark green landscape extended from the west all the way to the north. If Lightning gazed at it for a long time, she would feel like going to crash to the ground. Therefore, she had to divert her attention to the azure of the sky every now and then to dispel the increasing sense of constraint. The low, thick clouds behind her, meanwhile, overspread the peaks of the impassable mountain range and enveloped border town with a thin film of mists and rain. Lightning was currently looking for a relic of 450 years old and misty forest. There was no doubt that this was a great exploration. Half a month ago when Roland had given her the task, she had promised to find the relic with great confidence. Unlike Supervisor Kara, the Snake of Magic, who strictly followed the hints in the ancient book with incredible obstinacy, Prince Roland stressed over and over again that the map was no more than a reference. He told Lightning to stay safe and that she did not need to feel sorry for failing to keep her promise. These words made the little girl quite happy. Lightning knew His Highness was right. Even if it used to be a grand castle, it would be ultimately swallowed by bushes and shrubs and reduced to ashes in the elapsed 400 years. But she still wanted to find that place. By locating the Star of David, she could thereby spot where Holy City of Tequila was. After hearing the full account, Lightning had instantly known what Tequila stood for. Down the relic, it was very likely that she could help the prince uncover the real reason behind the battle between the church and demons, which the church strenuously tried to conceal. This was going to be much more fun than exploring new routes with her father. Using the method of making nautical charts, Lightning first drew some grids on a square parchment and then filled each grid out based on the distance she covered in a certain period of time. When all the grids were filled out, her task was done. She had filled out half of the grids already. The rain clouds behind approached her faster than she had anticipated. The little girl could even hear muted thunders when layers of clouds rolled by. She lowered the height and flew toward the forest below at a tremendous speed. Just then, she caught a glimpse of a transient white-gray shadow from the corner of the eye. For a second, Lightning was not sure what exactly she had seen. So, she stopped flying, hovered in the air and turned around to glance about the area she had just passed by. Nothing particular was found. Lightning wondered if that was an illusion. She decided to examine the area once again. This time, she flew even lower, low enough to make out peeling tree trunks, splitting twigs and leaves in various shapes out of the entire green forest. She again saw the details of the color block. A few minutes later, Lightning suddenly discovered a small part of a white stone tower sticking out from layers of branches. As the top of the tower was chopped off and its lower part was hidden in the forest, it was pretty hard for her to see it from the sky. If it was not because of the rain clouds, she probably would have missed it. Lightning's heart was pounding in her chest. Could that be the relic marked on the map? She flew around the stone tower but did not perceive anything unusual. Therefore, she decided to take a closer look. After landing, the little girl noticed it was not technically a white stone tower. Instead, it was covered with vines and mosses and turned out to be a grayish-green color when she drew closer. The tower was slightly tilted as if it had been struck by some great forces. Stones of the same material and color as the tower littered on the ground, which appeared to have fallen off the top. Some bigger ones were still visible, while other smaller ones had been buried in the grass and soil. The tower was colossal, whose base was almost as big as Prince Roland's castle. For this kind of edifice, there was usually a basement beneath the ground. Lightning should have recorded the location of the relic and returned to border town immediately. 
A sensible voice in her head was telling her it was not a good idea to enter a relic of hundreds of years old, for the toxic underground gases were sufficient to kill her. But lightning was rooted to the ground and was burned with curiosity. Another dauntless voice was urging her to take a peek, to take just one peek. She looked up at the sky. The cloudless sky now appeared sullen. Apparently, a heavy rain was on the way. Lightning finally found a justification for herself to enter the tower, since it was not comfortable to fly in the rain, she had to get into the tower to keep herself from getting wet. If she found the basement, she would absolutely not go down there alone. After making up her mind, Lightning, driven by her great curiosity, went up to the entrance covered with vines. She pulled out her dagger from the waist and managed to drill a small hole for her to creep in. The wooden door frames had been rotten long before, and she went into the tower without any difficulties. As the top of the tower had been chopped off, Lightning could clearly see everything without a torch. She searched the first floor of the tower but found nothing. Evidently, anything exposed to sunlight had been wiped out by the sands of time without leaving the slightest traces behind. There was nothing left on the ground floor of the tower other than the ruins of the wall. Lightning also found some holes for staircases that started from the floor to the ceiling, but no staircases were ever found. It was fairly easy for her to locate the passage leading to the basement. It was on the southwest side of the ground floor, right across the entrance to the tower. Lightning suspected that she could probably find Holy City of Tequila mentioned in the ancient book if she advanced toward barbarian land in this direction. While she was pondering, she felt something dropped on her nose. It was rain. She thus slowly entered that passage winding down to the basement and took a turn. There, she reached a wooden door. Although the door had not been completely eroded, it was quite dilapidated as if it were going to crack into pieces upon a gentle touch. Presently, the light drizzle turned into a pouring rain. The rain pattered on the ground in torrents and obscured her vision. Although lightning was standing somewhere dry, puddles soon overflowed and the water started to trickle down the stone staircases. In order not to get her shoes wet, she managed to float above the ground with her two feet dangling in the air. Suddenly, lightning heard a feeble, obscure yell in the rain. The sound made her hair all stood up on its ends. The little girl glanced about in horror. The narrow passage was littered with nothing but a few dead vines here and there. With the help of the dim light from outside, she opened her bag and took out a portable torch in flints, attempting to light the torch for a further examination. At that moment, she again heard the shout. This time, she realized the sound was coming from the wooden door behind. Lightning shuddered in fright and turned around immediately. The torch fell to the ground and the water splashed over her body. This time, the voice was clearer. Although still pretty quiet, it was loud enough for her to figure out it was a woman. Is someone in the basement? Her back was instantly covered with cold sweats at this thought. How could that be possible? The stone tower should be a relic of over 400 years old. As it situates in the middle of nowhere deep down in the misty forest, who could have come here other than me? Help me. By the time the woman yelled for the third time, the voice had become fairly clear. It was indeed behind the wooden door. Someone was truly asking for help. Lightning swallowed hard. She put her hand on the doorknob cautiously and then gently pushed the door open. The wet, goopy wooden door fell backward and hit the ground, accompanied by a muffled clunk. A tall, stout figure appeared before her abruptly. Lightning felt all her blood froze. The figure looked exactly like the demon Soraya had drawn. In the dismal light, Lightning sensed that the demon was also gazing at her. Its giant stature slightly leaned forward. In its hand, which had only three fingers, was an axe glistening with dark red blood stains. In a second, she recalled the day when these fiends had slaughtered the witches from the Witch Cooperation Association. Ah! Lightning shrieked at the top of her shrill voice. She threw the flints in her hand at the demon and darted out of the passage as fast as she could. She flew straight into the rain and headed toward Border Town. Lightning did not notice, however, that the flint hit the demon on his chest at a crisp and clear sound. 
Some tiny cracks soon appeared around the area that was hit and then started to expand all over the demon's body. The demon gradually shattered into pieces as more cracks emerged. It finally reduced to some white ashes that eventually melted into the wind. Chapter 151, The Negotiation, Part 1 After visiting the steam engine, Roland and Margaret returned to the office in the castle and continued to discuss the details of the business contract. If such a discussion involved bargaining, it could commonly take one or two days. To save effort, the Lord would usually entrust its treasurer to do the negotiation, while revealing the number and bottom line to him. But this time Margaret insisted that the price was non-negotiable, which saved Roland a lot of effort. I guess I'll be here again after one month, with three sloops full of saltpeter, the businesswoman said as she hastily took notes on a parchment, calculated by 90% of the market price, it is worth about 315 gold royals. By then the little town would have manufactured two steam engines. Roland lowered the number deliberately. They're worth 1,000 gold royals. You can pay the price difference with gold royals or with other goods. What kind of goods? Iron, copper, lead, green alum, Roland said, nothing but common minerals. But for the first three items, what I need are not ores, but metal ingots. In addition, I also need ten sets of crystal glass vessels. As to whether I need them with or without carvings, be them kettle or wine glass, it doesn't matter to me, as long as they're the finest products from the alchemical workshop of the King's City. If they're worth more than two steam engines, I can pay you in gold royals or you can deduct the price difference from the next month's two steam engines. You seem to take me as your exclusive businesswoman, Margaret said with a smirk. Although I'm not involved in mine management, I do know a few peers who are in this line of business. What surprises me is there are so many opportunities in this barren isolated area. Not many nobles are living here and yet your saltpeter consumption is enormous. The town was established because of North Slope Mine but yet it needs to outsource ores. All that's happening here really contradicts my common knowledge. Your Highness, your domain is remarkable. A major feature of industrial production is that it takes in massive raw materials and gives out end products. Roland laid out his hands and said, this town will need more raw materials in the future. I think we can reach a long term, at that moment, Margaret was suddenly surprised looking behind Roland with her eyes wide open. Roland was startled and then turned around subconsciously. He then saw Lightning, who was soaked to the skin, standing next to the French window. Her hands were clinging to the glass, and her face pale, on her forehead were fringes of hair with water flowing by, she looked like just being salvaged from a pond. Roland hurriedly stood up and opened the window. Lightning flew in and threw herself into Roland's arms. At that point, her nerves were able to loosen up, and she totally rested her body on Roland and then passed out. Nightingale, go get Nana, Roland said anxiously. Yes, sir. A reply came from his side without anybody shown. What happened? Since she could fly, she shouldn't have encountered demonic beasts or demons. Or they could fly too. Roland roughly checked Lightning's physical condition and found no obvious injury. He was slightly relieved. Your Highness, is she, the Lightning whom you mentioned? Putting one hand on her mouth, Margaret slowly walked to the prince and carefully examined the little girl in his arms. Roland was startled. Damn it! How could I forget about her? He shouted toward the door, Sean. The guard then walked into the office. I'm sorry, Miss Margaret. I have no choice but keep you here for some time. Holding lightning in his arms, Roland stood up and said to the guard, Take this businesswoman from the King's City to the guest room on the first floor. Keep a close eye on her. Don't let her out without my order. Yes, sir. What? No, your highness, wait a moment. Margaret suddenly realized something. I hold no grudge toward witches. Besides, she's the daughter of Thunder. I won't tell the church. Just in case. Roland interrupted her. I'll come back to you for verification later. Your highness, she woke up, Nightingale opened the door and said. Roland nodded. 
Following Nightingale, he walked into the bedroom. The water bucket at the bedside was giving off steam with lightning's wet clothes randomly hung on. A group of witches surrounded the bed. Wendy sat on the head of the bed combing lightning's hair. Her hair was still wet, but yet her face was not that pale anymore. Lightning leaned at the bedside with two pillows on her back. The quilt was pulled so high that only the upper half of her face was shown. She stared at Roland motionlessly. How is it going now? No injury. It was a trauma caused by the exhaustion of her magical power, Nightingale replied. After Wendy helped her with cleaning, she soon woke up in bed. Roland walked to the bedside and said with a smile, What happened? Why did you fly back in such a hurry in the rain? I found the ruin, Lightning murmured, but demons are inside. The crowd was startled upon hearing this. You went in? Scroll asked. No. Lightning shook her head, and then began to tell the whole story. A demon was guarding the gate. I heard someone inside calling for help, but I was so scared that I had no way to save her but to escape by myself. She slightly shrunk her head in the quilt. Am I no longer being qualified to be an explorer? No, you've done well. Roland consoled her. An excellent explorer understands to act according to the situation, while not putting him or herself in danger. When you couldn't save her, escaping was your best choice. Is she a witch in the stone tower? Wendy asked, because except for witches, no one else could reach so deep into Misty Forest. Witches won't go there either. Scroll shook her head. It's a ruin from 450 years ago that we're talking about. Without the guidance of a map, to locate the stone tower among the countless trees is as difficult as climbing up to heaven. Unless. Unless what? Roland asked. Unless they have been living there all along, Scroll slowly replied. Do you mean they didn't go there from the kingdom but had been living there since 450 years ago? They had lived in isolation, generation after generation. Although not saying so, the prince had deep down denied this speculation. What would it mean by living in a primitive forest? It's full of elusive beasts, horrible insects and toxic animals, no stable source of food, and even Bear grills couldn't live in such a place for long. Not to mention in this world there are months of long snowy winter, and demonic beasts and demons running wildly. Settling down in Misty Forest basically means committing suicide. Roland looked at Lightning. Was there any trace of people living near the ruins? No, the little girl said while shaking her head. Perhaps there's more than one map, Soraya said. Perhaps there are other people searching for the whereabouts of Tequila just like us. No matter what, we can't help them. Leaf sighed. Except Lightning, no one can reach the stone tower quickly. I'm afraid we won't know the actual situation until we get there. Roland stroked his chin. Anyway, it's cheering that you return safe and sound. Tonight's class will be dismissed. Everybody get a good rest. The truth will be revealed when the time is ripe. After leaving Lightning's bedroom, Roland said to Nightingale, We've yet another problem to deal with. As long as she's removed of the God's Stone of Retaliation, Nightingale said with a smile, I'll do the rest. Chapter 152 The Negotiation, Part 2 The rain had basically stopped. The layers of clouds were dyed red by the setting sun. Roland pushed open the guestroom door to see Margaret walking back and forth in front of the fireplace seeming rather agitated. The moment the guard Sean saw Roland coming, he bowed and left. Upon seeing Roland, Margaret hurriedly walked up and asked, Your Highness, how's Lightning doing? Roland was startled, unexpecting such a response from her. He had speculated that she might be peaceful, angry, or maybe cold, but never expected that she would show any concern for Lightning. She's fine, only tired. Really? That's good. She looked relieved. You seem to care about her. She looks very much like her father, especially that pair of long and narrow eyes and her pointed nose. I can tell she must be Thunder's daughter. After saying this, Margaret unbuttoned her collar and took down a string of gold jewelry on her neck. 
the verification you mentioned, you mean to judge me with the help of a witch's magic power, right? If my sincerity can be proved like this, then could you ask her to also join the conversation? I don't like being spied on. The string of jewelry was composed of a gold chain and a light blue gemstone which was cut into a polyhex. It must be a high-quality god stone of retaliation, Roland thought. Roland was surprised by her proposal because he had just been thinking about how he should bring that up without making her uncomfortable or suspicious. To be honest, he kind of admired this fjord's woman. Although she was in a fairly disadvantaged situation, she was still trying to take the initiative of the conversation. Both her negotiation skills and her conduct proved her a successful businesswoman. Roland took the god stone of retaliation from Margaret's hand and hung it on the clothes rack beside the fireplace. With such a good quality, this god stone of retaliation might be able to rest on any magic power within a one-meter range. In Nightingale's eyes, this was the same as a huge black hole. Perhaps Nightingale had dodged far away to escape from this stone. Let's talk in the living room, Roland said. Since the woman had shown sincerity, Roland did not want to appear too harsh. When the two of them stepped into the living room, Nightingale had already shown herself and sat on the seat of the host. Holding her chin with hands, her position looked as if she had been waiting a long time. It seems she's thinking the same as me, Roland thought. After everybody was seated, Roland started to introduce them. This is Nightingale. She can tell whether you're telling the truth. Hello, Miss Nightingale. Margaret nodded toward Nightingale, and Nightingale greeted her likewise. You once said that you meant no harm to the witches. What do you mean by that? This was the first question that Roland posed, which was also the thing he wanted to know the most. As far as I know, the church also has power in the fjords. But its influence is incomparable to that of the three gods. Or in other words, most of the people in the fjords have similar beliefs to San Nation. They worship the sky, the ocean, and the earth. As to me. She paused. I used to have a very close friend. Once we encountered a storm when we went fishing in the sea. Our sailing ship was cut into two by a giant wave. Through this disaster, my friend became a witch who could breathe like fish. I lost consciousness in the ocean, and it was she who found me and dragged me ashore. What happened next? Nightingale asked curiously. When I woke up, she'd left. Perhaps compared to staying with me, she yearned more for living in the sea, Margaret said regretfully, since then, I've never seen her again. The villagers used to say that when there was fog on the sea, she would guide the fishing boats with her singing to avoid reefs. No matter what, my friend can neither be an evil person, nor can she be the devil's minion. Roland nodded. Witches are awakened commoners. If one has had a profound understanding of the witches before their awakening, the impression one has on them won't be easily altered by what the church advocates. You seem to know much about witches' abilities. How did you guess that I have more than one witch here by the few words that I said? To be honest, because of this childhood friend, I became very curious about witches. I even considered taking in such special girls, Margaret said with a smile. Up until then, Nightingale had not found any evidence of Margaret lying, which basically ruled out the possibility that she would be a snitch to the church. Roland felt relieved and then said with a bit of guilt, it seems that I've been too suspicious. I hope you won't mind. Of course not. I understand that your highness was doing this for the safety of lightning and, this girl, Margaret said while waving a hand, it'd have meant you're too irresponsible if you did nothing but stand by. Are you familiar with thunder? Roland asked, your concern toward lightning indeed exceeds the kind of concern one person shows toward the children of a hero. Faced with this question, Margaret hesitated for a moment. Then Roland said it would not matter if she did not want to answer, but slowly she began to tell the story. To be honest, after I left the village, I used to join in Lord Thunder's expedition team and went through a fairly long period of going on exploration trips with him. As a new member of the team, Lord Thunder and his wife showed particular care to me. When Lightning was born, I was there to witness it. Was she born on a ship? Yes, during a fierce storm. Out of the cabin, the thunder and lightning never ceased. 
Not long after her birth, Lord Thunder's wife passed away due to an infection of septicemia, and I acted half of her mother. Since there was no breast milk, I chewed oatmeal, mixed it with fish roe and fed her bit by bit. Margaret's voice became very tender. Lord Thunder was extremely sad, but yet he still managed to command the whole crew. Without a backbone, the crew was likely to collapse through the months-long voyage. I lived in the cabin and watched lighting growing. That expedition ended when Lord Thunder found Shadow Islands and we returned to see Dragon Bay. After that, I left the fjords and settled down in the King City of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. That's what happened. Roland thought to himself, no wonder when she heard the name of Thunder, she reacted so strongly. As to why she stopped following Thunder with his expeditions, it's not hard to guess. Not every story started with a love scenario ends up with a love scenario. But what a twisted and turned coincidence, having such a connection with her. Will I get a bigger discount on my trade with her? Roland coughed twice. Miss Margaret, you and I are sort of acquaintances now, so our business. Your Highness, that's not how it works, Margaret said with a smile, business is business. That's our unwavering principle. Chapter 153, The Alchemy, Part 1 Kyle Sichi walked into the alchemical workshop. When the apprentices saw Kyle enter, they immediately bowed and said, Respected Chief Mentor. He waved his hand. Carry on everyone. The apprentices sat back down to continue their work. The outermost part of the workshop was the washroom. Here was where the materials arriving from all over Kingdom of Grey Castle were cleaned, sorted, filtered, and ground. The design of the washroom was very clever, where there was a stone surface placed flat over a creek, acting as a walkway, leaving both side access to two flowing streams. Passing over the smaller creek, you would find a cleaning area at the farthest side. At first glance, the long and narrow washroom looked like it was divided by the two streams into three sections. The light coming through the side windows would reflect off the stone and the stream's surface, sending long strips of light throughout the room. The overlapping of light and shadow resembled the skin of a snake. There were nearly 100 apprentices leaning against the walls, dealing with the materials assigned to them. If the debris to be removed were lighter than water, it was just tossed into the stream. If the material sank in the water it was then placed into a basket and taken to the washroom to be discarded. Cleaning with running water was several times more effective than using the stagnant water in a wooden bowl. The apprentices would study here for the next three to five years. Only when they had become adept at sorting and cleaning all kinds of materials would they get the opportunity to be selected as a disciple by an instructor and then move to the next room. Kyle, stepping on the dark and light stripes, entered the core area of the alchemical workshop, the refining room. When he opened the door, a large room opened up before him. Twelve giant wooden pillars had been brought from Misty Forest to support this spacious room. Many windows liked the walls, and there was even a skylight on the roof making the room bright. In the center of the refining room there sat six wide wooden tables. On them, there were all kinds of alchemical utensils, round-bottomed flasks, beakers, protective glasses, scales, mortar and pestles, furnaces, crucibles. Each instructor managed and was responsible for their own table. As for himself, being the Redwater City's chief alchemist, he naturally got the longest table, with the most tools on it. The room was always full of clutter and in disorder, just like the alchemy process itself. Mixing all kinds of raw materials together and then heating, performing dry distillation, watering or incinerating them, the results were ever-changing and fascinating. After experimenting, if the combination worked out, that specific process would be written down as a formula. As long as a person was able to create their own unique, successful, formula they were considered an alchemist. He had already conducted ten successful alchemy experiments, and each of them worked as if it were coming from the deities themselves. Kyle believed that if his alchemy was perfected he would not only be able to break things down into their separate parts, but also combine all things. Chavez, how far have you progressed with your imitation-powdered snow?" he asked. A young man around twenty years old came over and shook his head. 
the damn alchemists in the King's City definitely added extra materials to it. The powder has been crushed too finely and it's near impossible to extract anything useful. He was the youngest alchemist in the alchemical workshop, generally, the creation of an alchemical formula required a long accumulation of knowledge and tryouts and sometimes even a bit of luck. Many people in the workshop had stayed as students their whole life, unable to ever progress further. Chavez, however, had an innate talent for alchemy. Two years ago, he had concluded how to obtain acidic liquid through dry distillation of green alum. From that moment, he won the respect of the five alchemists, claiming his own long table in the room. Take it easy and be patient. Kyle smiled and patted the young man's shoulder, comforting him. Being a chief instructor for eight years, Kyle naturally understood the difficulty of finding true logic through disorder and chaos. However, I did manage to create something good yesterday evening. We can at least show something to those arrogant people now. Come with me. He went to his table and asked two students to bring him a storage box. The box was about half the height of a person and made completely out of iron, making it nearly impossible to be stolen or destroyed. He pulled out the key and opened its first drawer. In the middle of the drawer laid a small piece of transparent crystal. Did you cut off a crystal? Next to him, Chavez took the crystal carefully into his hand to examine it, holding it in front of the window. No, this is… crystal glass. God, you succeeded. Correct. Kyle smiled proudly. I can't wait to see the expression on their faces when they discover that their proudest alchemical discovery has been successfully duplicated by me. Chavez, unable to control his praises, drew the attention of the other alchemists. They all left their work and came over to see for themselves. Is this what you were working on until late last night? It's incredible. It's so beautiful, looking just like a crystal. Congratulations. With this, the status of our alchemic workshop will once again rise in the eyes of the Duke. How are you able to achieve this? Can you tell us? Kyle nodded. It's widely known that the composition of glass greatly resembles that of river sand, but in the end when it's burned, the glass color will still vary because the sand contains impurities. So, we have to either find a way to remove all of the impurities or obtain purer sand. Everyone was trying it using these methods and so was I. However, the reason for this time's alchemical success was largely attributed to luck. I selected a fine white sand from Willow Town and the sandstone from Fallen Dragon Ridge. Everyone around him was listening quietly, and when he had finished his explanation, the alchemists exclaimed together. So that's how it was done, telling us that was very thoughtful of you. Crystals were both rare and expensive gemstones but a transparent crystal was even rarer. Only the purest glass of all could be considered as crystal glass. This was the product that the alchemist workshop in King City relied upon in order to dominate over the Redwater City's alchemic workshop. In addition, the gold royals that brought them every year had the Duke of Redwater City greatly envy them. Now, everything would soon change. If Chavez could also figure out the composition to create the snow powder, in addition to his method of creating the acid, they would finally be able to outrank the alchemist workshop in the King City. By that point, the people who looked down their nose at them would have to bow their arrogant heads. Thinking about this greatly boosted Kyle Sichi's mood. As he was preparing to screen the raw materials needed for the second batch of crystal glass, a panicking student ran to his side. Respected chief mentor, a messenger from the western region's border town wants to see you, who has brought you a letter from the fourth Prince Roland Wimbledon. Prince Roland? Kyle frowned, it seemed that there was indeed such a person in the royal family from the kingdom of Grey Castle. He did not know much about the noble, but as far as he was concerned, they were all uneducated and ignorant, always fighting for power and wealth. What does he need me for? I don't know, the messenger said that once you read the letter, you'll naturally understand what His Highness want. The chief alchemist revealed an impatient look, assuming that the content of the letter would be either an offer to recruit him for a lot of money or to denounce alchemy as a devil's trick. However, since the other person was a prince, he still had to maintain a basic level of etiquette. Take me to him, and after I get the letter, send him on his way. 
Yes, respected chief mentor. Chapter 154, The Alchemy, Part 2 By the time Kyle Sichi returned home, it was already dark outside. After he had dinner with his family, he returned to his study and recorded the formula and the raw materials for the crystal glass in the book he was writing, The Door to Alchemy. In it, he had recorded his biography starting from the day he had become an apprentice until the day he became a chief alchemist. In addition, he also included the alchemic formulas they had discovered over the years at the alchemical workshop of Redwater City. Kyle believed that with this book, he would earn a place in history. Thousands of years later, alchemists would still remember his name. Only after the candle had burned out completely, did Kyle finally put down his pen and prepare to go to bed. Suddenly, he remembered the letter from the prince. Glancing at the soon-dying candle, he decided to use the last of its light to finish the letter so that he could give a verbal reply to the messenger the next day. The tiny candle would not allow him to write more than a few dozen words, but it was more than enough to read this worthless letter by. He opened the envelope and saw that it contained three pages. The first page was the usual formal introduction full of titles and territory. Kyle did not even bother reading it and just moved straight to the second page. The content of the second page took him by surprise, and there was no recruitment offer or denouncing. Instead, there were five strange formulas written on it. After carefully examining them, he noticed that each formula was composed of the same three sentences. Oh, this is interesting. He smiled even though he still did not know what the purpose of the letter was. The prince was quite good at mystifying. He glanced over the first line. Dry distillation of saltpeter produces nitric acid. Saltpeter. Dry distillation. Nitric acid, all these were terms used in alchemy. Wait a minute, Kyle's heart suddenly stopped. Isn't this one of the double stone acid making methods of the alchemic workshop? The acidic liquid produced by the dry distillation of saltpeter had to be collected in a special container. It looked just like water vapor, so it was hard to recognize. It was, however, very corrosive. Apart from skin removal, it could also dissolve specific metals. This is actually an alchemic formula. Does this mean that there's an alchemist in Border Town? He quickly moved his sight to the next line. The first sentence had already surprised him, but the second sentence was even more incredible. It consisted of a bunch of weird symbols, one after another, forming an equation. Kyle frowned, for he had never seen such strange symbols. Looking further down the letter, it appeared that the third sentence was the explanation for the previous two. This line included the names and meanings for each of the symbols. However, these words were so difficult to pronounce that it almost seemed as if they were made up. To help him link the words with the symbols he read them over and over. Even so, he was still having trouble understanding the full meaning of the entire sentence. At this point, the candle flame sputtered twice and then flickered out. Damn it! Kyle cursed silently, and without hesitating, he took a new candle from his drawer and lit it. By the time the second candle had burnt down halfway, the hands of the chief alchemist were shaking slightly. For a letter that appeared to mean nothing, it had taken him a very long time to read. The five's formulas on the second page were actually all alchemical formulas. It was not unimaginable that an excellent alchemist would manage to come up with five formulas on his own, but the amazing part was that four of them, excluding the first one for the acid-making process, were all connected to each other. Certain words would appear repetitively, creating what seemed like a balanced cycle. Nitric acid reacts with silver to form silver nitrate, just like water with nitric oxide. Silver nitrate reacts with iron to form ferrous nitrate and silver. Silver nitrate reacts with copper to form copper nitrate and silver. Copper nitrate reacts with iron to form ferrous nitrate and copper. He had previously also tested the alchemical reaction by putting a silver bar into the acidic liquid and part of the silver bar was clearly dissolved beyond recognition, which was an attribute of the acid. It would dissolve anything, but according to the letter, because silver nitrate was soluble in water, it would seem that it had disappeared, but in fact, it still existed in a different state and had not been destroyed. 
How is that even possible? No. Kyle shook his head. Apparently, the other side had already anticipated his doubts. The connection between these formulas was not coincidental and he realized that he was given the opportunity to personally verify them. He could try it with silver, iron or copper, and these were all common minerals. If he was to perform alchemy according to the later formulas, the silver would reappear, proving that it was not destroyed but still existed within the acid. Seeing the orderly and neatly arranged formulas on the paper, he started breathing heavily. If these alchemical formulas were proven to be real, his years of accumulated experience, the efforts of his colleagues, as well as everything he had written in his book The Door to Alchemy, would be nothing more than a joke. You and the kid can go to sleep first, and I have to go back to the alchemical workshop. Disregarding his wife's surprised look, Kyle put on his coat and rushed out straight into the night. Arriving at the alchemic workshop, he immediately called the three students on duty and told them he had to conduct an alchemical experiment. He had them light the torches and candles, saying the more the merrier. Everything was soon arranged on his long table that was now brightly illuminated by the flames. The students began shuffling between the materials warehouse and the refining room, preparing the experiment materials for their chief alchemist Kyle. There was still plenty of acid that had been produced by the dry distillation of saltpeter in storage, so he was able to start verifying the second formula right away. He took some of the acid and poured it into a glass. Then, he placed a silver bar into it. As the reaction started, the bar gradually dissolved, creating several bubbles. As he waited anxiously, Kyle turned his attention to the third page of the letter. There was only a short sentence on it. This was merely a small part of my work. For more answers, come to Border Town. Damn it. Writing this sentence is totally useless. Once I verified the formulas, I would definitely have to pay a visit to this unknown alchemist master. Otherwise, he would not have been able to sleep again for the rest of his life. Once the bubbles dissipated, he removed what was left of the dissolving silver bar and put a small piece of copper into the cup in its place. Soon, something incredible started to happen. A thin white crust began to appear on the surface of the copper, much like a beetle's skin. The white crust continued to expand and soon covered the entire surface of the copper. As for the previously colorless acid in the glass, it gradually turned a shade of blue. Exactly as it had been described in the letter. The white matter is the silver, and the newly created substance, copper nitrate, is soluble in water just like the silver nitrate. However, it'll turn the acid sky blue. Staring into the cup, Kyle Sichi stood there motionlessly. The next morning, when Chavez arrived at the alchemical workshop, he was shocked to see the chief alchemist. He looked completely exhausted and had big black circles around his eyes indicating he had not slept. Didn't you go home to sleep last night? Chavez asked surprisedly, did you decide to stay up and wait for the second batch of crystal glass? Kyle shook his head while dragging Chavez over to his table and he said tiredly, you were once my most valued student, so I want to ask you, what do you think about alchemy? Ah. Uh, just like what you taught me. His attention was drawn to the table where a number of glasses had been placed, filled with solutions of varying colors. The most eye-catching one was the one that was sky blue. Was this the reason the chief alchemist stayed up last night? Although Chavez was confused, he still replied honestly, like you, I believe that the essence of alchemy is to find the logic within all the disorder and chaos. No, no, Chavez, I was wrong. Kyle interrupted him. Everyone is wrong. That is an alchemy. Not true. Chavez felt that his teacher was acting strangely. First, he had spent the whole night performing alchemy, and now he was asking weird questions. Before he could ask for an explanation, the chief alchemist continued, unlike what you and I previously believed, there's more order in alchemy. An order that might even be considered a strict order, like in mathematics where one plus one will always equal two. No matter what changes are performed, the material amounts don't increase, decrease or disappear, for they just change forms. Will never increase, decrease, or disappear. What are you talking about? Isn't that what alchemists do? 
They combine common materials to create new and incredible things, Chavez asked confused. Yes, that's also what I used to think, but after receiving a letter from the Lord of Border Town. Kyle patted his shoulder, and what he said next shocked Chavez. I'll soon leave for Border Town to find answers. You. Do you want to come with me?